a new mother, her beautiful little baby girl. It was her pride and joy, and she did everything she could to be the most amazing mother possible. She loved her little girl as only a mother can. But one day, her little girl was sound asleep, taking her nap, and she was working in the kitchen and she realized she was missing an ingredient. And maybe possibly her neighbor might have it. She checked on the little baby, sleeping peacefully, everything seemed okay. She thought, I'm just gonna run next door and get the ingredient from the neighbor and come right back and everything will be fine. So she did, and you know how things go. She got talking to the neighbor and it took longer than she expected. And time went by and all of a sudden they heard something. They heard a siren, a call, fire, fire. And she looked and her neighbor looked, they ran to the door and it was her house. Her home had caught on fire. She raced back. The neighbors were gathering. The firemen were there trying to put the fire out. And her one thought in her mind was, my baby, sound asleep upstairs in her little bedroom. She rushed in wanting to go and get in and the firemen restrained her. They said, you can't, you can't go in there. The fire is too hot. Nobody can enter the house. Oh, but my baby. And with a mother's superhuman strength, she wrestled herself out of their grasp and ran in to the burning home, rescued her baby girl, and was helped out through the window. But alas, there was a price. Her hands, her hands were badly burned. Yes, her baby was safe and she had her life, but her hands were burned. You know, uh, she didn't mind at all. I mean, what mother's love wouldn't mind those scars? But fast forward a few years later, and her little baby girl had grown up now to a young girl. And she was watching her mother work in the kitchen one day, when all of a sudden she blurted out, Mom, why are your hands so ugly? Well, I'm so excited that we could come out here together in the woods. And I'm so excited that Christina could come and share this precious and touching story. Can't wait to hear the rest of the story and what God's word has to say in regards to this message, the point of this message about those ugly hands. Well, before we go too much further, why don't we bow our heads together and let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for this beautiful day and the beautiful place and that Christina and I can be here together to share from your word. I pray that you will bless her lips as she is sharing with us today. And Lord, that you will bless each one who is watching and listening, that we may all come to a deeper appreciation of the sacrifice you came to give for each one of us. Thank you, Lord, from the bottom of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. You ready to go to the woods? Let's go. I think there's some wildflowers out today and I can't wait to see them. I can't wait either. I think we'll see some of them too. Let's go on the trail. All right, let's go.
I can just imagine the feelings that washed over the mother as her daughter asked her that question, Mom, why are your hands so ugly? I can just see the tears filling her eyes and running down her cheeks. Yes, her hands were ugly, but it wasn't something to be ashamed of. She was proud of it because it was her love. It was a symbol of her love and how she saved her daughter's life. I can just see her picking her up and holding her in her arms as she said, my child, these hands are ugly for you because I loved you, because I saved you from our burning home when you were just a baby. You know, when we look in scripture, we find a lot about hands. And as Daniel mentioned earlier, our sermon title today is Those Ugly Hands. I'd like us to turn in our Bibles and we're going to take a journey through scripture. Now, obviously we can't look at all of them, but I wanna look at some of my favorite passages that mention God's hands. Do you realize that the Bible talks a lot about God's hands? We're going to go through the Bible chronologically, not in the order of how the Bible verses come, but in the chronological order of our story. And our story begins in Psalms 119 verse 73. It says, your hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. God's hands made us. And of course, this takes us back to the book of Genesis, where God himself stoops down and in the dust forms Adam intricately, every part of him exactly as he wants with his own hands, and then breathes into him the breath of life, and Adam becomes alive. Wow. God's hands. God's hands formed you. God's hands formed me. That's amazing. So then we go to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 12. God is speaking here. He says, I have made the earth. I created man on it. I, my hands, stretched out the heavens. And all their hosts I have commanded. God created the entire world. Once again, this takes us back to Genesis 1. God says he created the whole world with his hands. Wow. And then we find one more passage on the same topic in the book of Job. Job chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. It says, but ask now the beasts and they shall teach thee. And the birds of the air, and they will tell thee. Or speak to the earth, and it will teach you. And the fish of the sea will explain it to you. What will they explain? Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? In whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind? Not only did God create the world, create the animals, create you and me, but he holds our breath, our very existence in his hand.
Exodus chapter 31 verse 8, we find something else about God's hands. It says, when God had made an end of speaking with Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him two tablets of the testimony written with the finger of God. We find the same thing in Deuteronomy 9 verse 10. Moses says, Then God delivered to me two tablets of stone written with the finger of God, and on them were all the words which the Lord had spoken to you on the mountain from the midst of the fire of the assembly. God's finger wrote on the two tablets of stone the Ten Commandment Law. His law of love and his law of protection for all mankind because he loved you and me. In Exodus chapter 33, we find an amazing story where Moses actually says to God, God, will you please show me your glory? And God says, well, no man can look at my face and live. But he says, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm going to put you in the cleft of a rock and I will cover you with my hand and then you will see my backside as I go by. And so we find in Exodus 33 verse 22, he says, while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand. God's hand of protection, because he loved Moses so much and wanted him to see just a glimpse of his glory, of his love, of his character, and so he did just that, and he put his hand over Moses in the cleft of that rock. And as he went by, he proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. And continues on with a beautiful description of who God is. While Moses was hiding under God's hand of protection. What a loving God we serve. And then we move on to the New Testament. Jesus in Matthew chapter 8 and we find the same story in Luke chapter 5. A leper comes to Jesus and he says, Lord, if you will, you can heal me of leprosy. And Jesus said to him, I will be thou clean. But what did he do? He touched him. Now, if you remember the laws of Israel, no man was to ever touch a leper. But Jesus was not afraid of leprosy. Jesus is not afraid of the power of sin because he was the ruler of this world. He was, has more authority over disease and sin and sickness. And so he unashamedly touched the leper and says, be clean. And that's what he wants to do for you and me too. He says, I am not afraid of you. I am not afraid to get my hands dirty. I am the one who stooped in the clay and wrote and formed you in the dirt. I got dirt under my fingernails to fashion you. I'm not afraid of your dirt and I'm not afraid of your sin. Be clean. There are so many stories in the New Testament where Jesus used his hands to heal someone who was sick. In Matthew chapter 8, you have Peter's mother-in-law who is in bed with a fever. 
And Jesus comes and takes her by the hand and heals her and she ministers to them. You have in Mark chapter 5 and the same story in Luke chapter 8, the story of Jairus' daughter and how Jairus comes to Jesus and he says, Lord, my little girl is sick. Please come and heal her. And as Jesus is trying to make his way through the pressing crowd and it's taking longer and longer to get to his house, a servant comes into the crowd and says to Jairus, don't trouble him because your daughter is already dead. And Jesus heard the words and he says to Jairus, do not be afraid, only believe. And Jairus clung onto that by faith and they got to his house and the mourners were already there weeping and wailing. And Jesus says to them, do not cry. And then he walks in with Jairus and his wife, his disciples, and he takes that little girl by the hand and says, little girl, arise. And she opened her eyes and she became back to life. She was alive, raised from the dead. And then you have the story in Luke chapter 7 of the widow of Nain. This poor widow had lost her only son, her only support in her old age. They had no social security back then. There was no way that anyone else could provide for her. And Jesus knew. And he came by as they were bearing this coffin to the grave. And he touched the coffin with his hand. Once again, showing his power over death. He was not afraid of death as he touches the coffin and people gasp in fear. And he says, young man, arise. And this young man jumps out of the coffin and helps carry it, the empty coffin, back home. He was healed. He was alive again. And then you've got Peter. In Matthew chapter 14, we have two stories, fascinating stories. The first one is the 5,000 men plus women and children who had gathered on the mountainside. Jesus had been teaching them all day and they were hungry. And he says to the disciples, you need to feed these people. And they're like, Lord, did you know there's only five barley loaves and two small fishes and one little lad's lunch and that's all we got? What are we supposed to feed them with? And Jesus says, bring them to me. And he takes his hands, those beautiful hands, and he breaks the bread. As he blesses it, gives thanks, begins to break the bread and the fish, and he keeps breaking and breaking and giving to his disciples, and they keep dispersing it to the multitudes. And there was enough bread and fish to feed all those people, plus 12 basketfuls left over all because of the hands of Jesus. And then that evening, as everyone is trying to proclaim Jesus king, he sends his disciples away, tells them, go into the boat and cross to the other side. They were so frustrated with Jesus. Why would he do this to them? Here, this was the perfect time to crown him king. The people were ready and Jesus sends them away like this? And Jesus disperses the multitude, goes up in the mountain, and begins to watch this little boat full of grumbling, complaining disciples. And as God looks upon their grumbling, he gives them something to grumble about, a storm. <laughs> and the storm rolls in, the thunder crashes, and the lightning flashes, and the waves roll in, and it was the worst storm that these seasoned disciples, the fishermen that knew how to handle their boat, had ever seen. But Jesus was watching. He was watching them, waiting for them to be ready for his presence, for his hand. And when they were finally ready, he appeared, walking on the water. The poor disciples are terrified. They think they see a ghost. And suddenly Jesus says, it is I. Don't be afraid. Peter, he's like, Lord, if it's you, tell me to walk on the water. And Jesus says, come. So Peter steps out of the boat, puts his feet on the water, and he's standing. And he begins to walk toward Jesus. 
And then he realizes the storm is still rolling and their waves are crashing around him. And he takes his eyes off Jesus for just a split second as a huge wave rolls in and suddenly he begins to sink. All he has time to do is holler out, Lord, save me. And Jesus takes his hand and he grabs Peter and pulls him up out of the water and says, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt me? And together they walk on the water back into the boat and the waves were still. The hand of Jesus is not just a hand to heal sickness. It's not just a hand to raise the dead to life. It's a hand to grasp in faith, to pick you up when you fall down. A hand that wants to be there for you when you've made a mess. A hand that's there for you. In John chapter 9, we find a blind man who comes to Jesus to receive his sight. And what does Jesus do once again? He stoops in the dirt and makes a ball of clay with his hands and puts it on the man's eyes and tells him to go and wash and he would see. Once again, Jesus, not afraid to get his hands dirty. And then in Matthew chapter 19, we find a beautiful story of these mothers who are bringing their children to Jesus so that he could lay his hands on them and bless them. The disciples, of course, tried to turn them away and send them away and say, no, 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 you don't understand. Jesus is too busy for you. And Jesus heard it. And in Matthew 19, verse 14, he says, let the little children come to me. For of such is the kingdom of heaven. Do not forbid them. And then he picked up those children with his hands, held them in his lap, put his hands on their heads, and blessed them. And then he told them that the kingdom of heaven is like to a child. And not only that, but whoever would harm one of these little ones, it would be better for him to have a millstone hung around his neck and be cast into the sea. God's children are precious to him, and his hands are ever near to bless. And then you have the closing scenes of Jesus' life. You have Jesus at the Last Supper, breaking bread with his disciples, washing his disciples' feet with his hands. Then you have him in the Garden of Gethsemane, and the soldiers come, and Judas betrays him. And those precious hands, those hands that have blessed so many people, are bound. And while they are binding him, one of the disciples slashes off the ear of the high priest's servant, and Jesus releases his hands and touches that servant's ear, and it's instantly made whole. And then he allows them to bind his hands. Those same hands, those beautiful hands stretched out in blessing, those beautiful hands that had done so much good for so many years, were at last nailed to a cruel cross, forever scarred by those ugly nails. And then you have the wonderful story in Luke chapter 24, you have these two disciples on their way back home to Emmaus. It has been the end of the, Jesus has been crucified. The weekend has been over. 
They don't realize that he has been raised from the dead. And they are so discouraged until someone begins to walk with them and open scripture to them like they'd never seen before. And then they get home and he's ready to walk on by and they said, no, 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 come, come, come and eat with us. And so he walks in and with his hands, he picks up the bread, he blesses it and he begins to break it. And they recognize, what did they recognize? His hands. It was those hands, the way he broke it, they recognized it. And then they looked and they saw the scars in his hands. And they knew immediately that this was Jesus. This was their Messiah. This was the one who had died on the cross and he was alive. And they quickly ran all the way back, the eight miles back to Jerusalem while Jesus was close on their heels. And they burst into the room where the disciples were and said, we have seen him. Jesus is here. He is alive. We have seen him with our own hands. We watched him break bread. We know it was his hands. And then all of a sudden, Jesus appeared. And they saw him face to face. And they felt his hands. They saw him. They knew it was him because of his hands. But there was one disciple who was not there. Thomas. And we find in John chapter 20, the disciples tell Thomas, we have seen him. We've seen the Lord. We know he was him. And Thomas says, absolutely not, because I didn't see him. And unless I put my hands into the nail prints in his hands, and unless I touch the spear print in his side, I will not believe that it was him. And so what did Jesus do? Rather than casting his doubting disciple aside, a little while later, Jesus appeared again to the disciples and Thomas was there. And what does Jesus do? In verse 27, he says to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands. Reach your hand here and put it in my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believe. And Thomas, as he puts his hand in Jesus' hands and feels those nail prints and sees those ugly scars, he falls at his feet weeping and says, My Lord and my God. And Jesus says to him, Thomas, you believe because you have seen my hands. But blessed are they who believe and have not seen them. last glimpses that we see of the hands of Jesus while he was still walking on this earth was in the last chapter of the book of Luke. Luke chapter 24. We see Jesus after he's met with the disciples, after he spent time with them, he takes a group of them out to Bethany and then he lifted out his hands and he blessed them. And while his hands were outstretched in blessing, he began to raise up into heaven. But before he did, his last words to the disciples, we find them in Matthew 28, and we find them in Mark 16. Matthew 28, 19 and 20, he said to them just before he left them, go, into all the world and preach the gospel to every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, 
teaching them to deserve, observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Go and make disciples. Go and preach the gospel. Mark 16. Uh, he says, go into the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. And then he says, and in these signs will follow them. In my name, they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And he goes on, and they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. The last words of Jesus to his disciples, as his hands are outstretched in blessing, as he is raising up into heaven, is, you are now my hands. You are my hands. I want you to be my hands to the rest of the world. Wow, have you ever thought that you are the hands of Jesus to those around you? I can't wait to get to heaven. And I can just imagine a little child running up to Jesus and looking at his hands and saying, Jesus, why are your hands so ugly? And I can just see the tears welling up in Jesus' eyes as the biggest smile crosses his face because he's not ashamed of his ugly hands. Those hands show his love for us. He's proud of them. Just like that mother was proud of her ugly hands. I can just see him saying, my child, these hands are ugly because I love you. Because I gave my life for you so you could be here with me for eternity. In Zechariah chapter 13, it says someone will come up to Jesus and say, why, why, are there, why are these wounds between your arms? And he will say, because I was wounded in the house of my friends. Jesus paid the ultimate price. He forever bears the scars with his ugly hands because of you, because of me, because he loves us. And he says to you right now, my child, do you love me? Will you be my hands to a hurting world? Will you share my love to those around you? Will you be my hands and feet? Will you show my love? And so this is my call to you today. Are you, are you willing? to be God's hands? Are you willing to say, Lord, because you were willing to bear these scars for me, I want to be your hands today. I want to show your love to a hurting world. If this is your prayer, I invite you to pray with me right now. Father, you see our hands. Father, we are sinful human beings. We can't do anything without you. Our hands are marred by sin. But Father, you, we have seen in your word how you created us, how you made us, how you made the whole world, how you are not afraid to get your hands dirty, how you formed and fashioned us from the dirt, how you forgive us of our sins, 
how you are willing to heal, to forgive, to raise from the dead, whatever it takes. How you are willing to sacrifice on the cross for us and forever bear those ugly scars. Lord, we just thank you for this. And we ask that you will use us, that you will cleanse us, that you will fill us with your love so that we can be your hands to a hurting world. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.